Okay, I would like to welcome everybody to our uh, program tonight on uh, considerations for selling timber. My name is John Woodmancy. I'm the extension educator in Whitley County in Indiana. And uh, tonight we have uh, Lenny Farley, who is our Purdue Extension Forester. Uh, just a few introductory remarks here. Um, we've got everybody on mute to start out. And so I would encourage everybody to use the uh, chat icon toward the bottom of your screen and that uh, you would, uh, if you have any questions, just go ahead and, and uh, uh, send that question to all participants. It doesn't have to be privately to a host or anything like that. So, um, and uh, the other thing I'd like to bring out is that uh, we have an evaluation at the conclusion of this program. It's only five or six questions, so we'd encourage you to take another three or four minutes. We'd really appreciate your feedback and uh, to to utilize that. We'll we'll use that to uh, see how we did and and build programs for coming uh, coming events, perhaps. Um, just to get an idea of what you learned and those kind of things. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Lenny Farley and I'm going to pass the presentation balloon to him and we'll get started. Thanks, John. All right, I'm gonna get ready to share my screen here and we'll start the presentation. As John mentioned, you can enter questions in the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll handle those as we go, so. All right, get everything up and showing here. All right, John, looks good. You see? Okay, great. That's what I needed to know is make sure everything's looking good. So we are gonna talk about considerations for selling timber. And I'm gonna essentially go through uh, some of the basic processes, some of the concerns folks have, how to address those risks and concerns, and what we would consider some of the best practices to follow. However, there's a variety of ways of going about this. And so uh, as you have questions, let us know. Uh, but this hopefully will give you some good guidance on what we think is a good way to approach this and some of the options you've got in terms of thinking about selling timber. And so maybe the first question, one of the best questions to go through is, well, why would I sell timber from my property? And we've actually got several pretty good reasons why you might might want to consider doing that as a part of your management of your property over time. Uh, one is that we can capture tree mortality. So trees do have a lifespan and for our hardwood, some of them live maybe 100 years, some of them live 250 years, some of them can live to be four or 500 years old. But all of them do have a lifespan and we may have an opportunity to capture some of the value in that wood by harvesting before they die. Uh, now, some folks actually enjoy having some dead trees in their property because they provide some wildlife habitat benefits. And that's certainly a choice you can make as well. Uh, we do have, in many cases, pretty significant economic value here in trees in Indiana. We have mostly hardwoods and some of our hardwood trees like this black walnut on the photo here, can go into high quality, high value markets like veneer, uh, furniture, paneling, flooring. Uh, so there's a wide variety of market outlets, a lot of different values represented by the different species and grades of tree. But we've got good market outlets for a wide variety of species and grades of trees that can come out of our property. Uh, one of the other good reasons to look at harvesting timber on a property is to actually help maintain forest growth through thinning. And so we can thin out the canopy of the forest to provide additional growing space for trees to continue to expand and grow those crowns, which is the wood producing and growth engine of the tree. Uh, essentially, we can only grow so many trees per acre of a certain size, and as trees get bigger, they need more crown space to continue to grow vigorously. We can provide that through the thinning that happens in timber harvesting. We can also provide additional open space and sunlight for regenerating a variety of different species of trees in the forest. And so we've got some species of trees like sugar maple and beech that can tolerate shade and regenerate well under the canopies of other trees, but the growth will be slow. We have other trees like tulip tree, black cherry, black walnut, some of the oaks that either need a fair amount or full sunlight to regenerate and do well. 
And so without some openings in the forest, we can actually start losing some of those species as the composition of our forest changes with that shading. Uh, timber harvesting can also be a powerful wildlife habitat and biological diversity management tool. By changing the amount of sunlight and competition in the forest through timber harvesting, we can provide a variety of different types of wildlife habitat and different structures that will attract and be utilized by different species through time. Also, uh, wood products are one of our most environmentally friendly products that we can uh, be utilizing in society for a variety of the different things we do, whether it be home building furniture, paper, uh, whatever it is, it is a highly sustainable and environmentally friendly product that you can feel good about having utilized. And the wood products industry is an important and large industry here in the state that employs a lot of people uh, to utilize those sustainable products through time. So we can feed into that system and maintain it as a healthy part of our economy here in the state as well. And so we mentioned that issue of maintaining good forest growth and keeping a healthy forest through timber harvesting. And I think this picture depicts that to some extent. Uh, what happens is, this is actually a plantation that I was privileged to plan many years ago and had a chance to visit it this last summer. Uh, those trees are now 16 inches in diameter. I remember seeing them as seedlings. And what's happened is there's a lot of competition going on here. Normally, if these trees had plenty of room to spread out their crowns, we'd have a nice circular crown occupying that space. But because we've got two large trees right next to each other, they've essentially flattened out their crowns and are competing really seriously with each other. And so each of those trees has about a half the crown that it might ordinarily have. We can actually provide additional growing space to one of those trees by harvesting the other. And so this is a good example of where we can do that and provide an opportunity to maintain good vigor and growth on the trees that we retain in the forest and also recover the wood value in the trees that are harvested. We can also create different structures and types of wildlife habitat and different environments to regenerate trees with different levels of light requirement. And so this is a, a, a private forest landowners property in Southern Indiana where they put in a relatively large uh, forest harvest opening. Uh, I think this was three or four acres in size. And not everybody would choose to do that one that large, but this actually provides a really significant and very useful different habitat type and an opportunity to regenerate a wide diversity of different tree species. And as you can see, this is filling back in very quickly with a lot of different tree and shrub species uh, that are gonna create a new forest through time. We can do that on smaller scales as well. Openings of a half acre to an acre and a half or two acres uh, produce a little bit less of a visual impact on the forest, but still provide that full light opportunity to regenerate light loving trees and a very different type of habitat for a wide variety of wildlife species. And with time, uh, obviously as those trees grow, we get different structures uh, and types of habitat provided. And so this is a, uh, the same type of opening we might see uh, 15 or 20 years after that harvest period, where we've now got a forest canopy that's starting to shade out the understory. It's gonna be a lot easier to walk through and suitable for a different set of wildlife species altogether. We can also make the choice to uh, uh, harvest uh, individual trees here and there and still leave a solid canopy over most of the forest area. And so that's also something we can look at at different parts of our property, or if you've got a large enough property, you could have openings in some locations and then do individual tree selection in others so that you're maintaining some high canopy forest in some locations, but creating that young forest habitat in others. So lots of flexibility that we can utilize harvesting in different locations at different intensities to meet our management objectives and provide a diversity of habitats on the property. And what we're finding is that this uh, creation of young forest areas, of forests of higher density and different structure can actually be a really important practice for some wildlife species that are in significant decline. Uh, here we have a songbird, the golden winged warbler, uh, a game bird, or at least it used to be a game bird, the rough grouse, actually no longer huntable here in Indiana and probably going to end up on our endangered species list. Uh, and then the whippoorwill, all of these species utilize younger forest areas as a significant part of their habitat. 
And because we've got yes, less young forest areas on the ground, all of these species have been in significant decline. So timber harvesting can actually be a very valuable and powerful tool we can utilize to favor some of these species of wildlife that are suffering otherwise because of the aging of, of so much of our forest area that's not providing the habitat they need. But understandably, a lot of folks have some concerns uh, and questions about the impact of timber harvesting on their property and how to go about it. And so some of the common concerns that I've run across in my career from folks considering timber harvesting is uh, it'll make my woods look bad. And so there's no doubt that when we put trees on the ground, there's a change in the visual aspects of a property for a period of time. There's concerns about potentially causing erosion through the operation of timber harvesting. Uh, how do I get a fair price in this process? I don't necessarily understand how this timber sales process works. Uh, am I gonna hurt wildlife significantly on my property by harvesting trees? And am I actually ruining my woods in this process? And all those are questions that have been asked in the past and are very valid questions. And hopefully we can address those to some extent this evening. So the first thing I would tell you is that there are ways that we can utilize uh, good practices to reduce risks in this process of uh, harvesting and marketing timber. And my first and most important recommendation to you, if you're thinking about harvesting timber uh, or managing your property in any context uh, in a forest management system, I think you should definitely tap into the services of a professional forester. And we have a great website here in Indiana that allows you to access professional forester assistance in your area. Uh, you can go to this website, findindianaforester.org, uh, put in your county and actually do a search for the foresters that are close to you, or you can get a statewide list and pick from that. And there's many folks across the state that are ready, willing, and able to give you assistance with management on your properties. Uh, these folks have years of experience in managing timber, in marketing timber, understand the process, can help walk you through it and help reduce the risks and alleviate some of the concerns you may have by addressing those situations with the practices they'll utilize. So there's a couple of different types of foresters that you're going to access uh, for timber sales assistance. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is the consulting foresters. And these are private business people, uh, professional foresters. They're working for landowners. It's typically on a, a fee or commission basis, and they will mark and market trees for sale in the process of selling timber. And they also offer a variety of other forest management services, and that might include timber valuation and inventory, uh, timber stand improvement, invasive species control, tree plantings, any number of things uh, that you may need done on your property. So these folks are actually working as a, essentially a contractor for you to help you mark and market your trees to meet your management objectives. The other folks that are available to assist landowners with uh, selling timber are industry foresters. And these folks work for or actually own forest products companies and are involved in uh, uh, buying standing timber and logs, uh, negotiating and marking sales, and harvesting timber on private lands. And in some cases, they're also offering additional management services uh, on for landowners in a variety of different contexts and through different types of agreements. Uh, so these folks are actually procuring forest products and typically their marking and, and uh, timber sales services are free to landowners, but also they are the folks buying the timber. Uh, so you've got to recognize you maybe won't have as competitive a process in that situation but you do get the access to professional forester assistance in either context. So some of the services you would expect your forester to provide for you in the process of marking and marketing these trees. Uh, the first one I think, in fact, if you're gonna be a long-term landowner is maybe the most important and that's selecting the appropriate trees to sell based on the condition of your property and your management objectives. And we'll talk a little bit more about that down the road, but that selection of trees to sell is very critical for the long-term health and value of your property and meeting your management needs based on what you wanna see happen in the future. Another really valuable service they can provide is an estimate of volume and value that you might want to look at selling to give you a feel for whether this is something you wanna go through with 
and help you plan in terms of uh, maybe tax issues, uh, managing uh, that situation or making that decision to do that now or later. Uh, the really powerful thing they offer you that really hardly anybody else can is uh, familiarity with the timber markets. And so the folks that know the timber markets are the foresters that are selling into it and the companies that are buying that timber. Uh, and it's a quick moving and complex marketplace. And so having somebody that recognizes uh, that marketplace, understands how it operates, is working in it on a regular basis is really a big advantage to you understand how best to market the timber you're interested in selling. And that's the next one is an effective marketing and advertising system to get your timber sold for the best price possible. You also, anytime you wanna sell a, uh, uh, essentially a property, which includes timber, you wanna have some kind of sales contract. And the professional foresters have contracts that are set up to help protect your rights, also protect the rights of the buyer, set up expectations for performance and payment, uh, liability, all those issues that are taken care of in a timber sales contract. Uh, they should also provide you with monitoring of the logging job to make sure that the contract with the logger is being followed. And so this is one of the things that you can expect in terms of services from your forester of after this timber has been sold, uh, visits to the logging site to make sure the performance is being carried through. Uh, they can also provide you with really some valuable information on tax issues, and we'll talk a little bit about that this evening as well. And then oftentimes after a timber sale, there's a little bit of follow-up management we might want to do. So it might be some thinning in areas where we didn't have the trees harvested we thought might be, uh, cutting or girdling some trees that have been damaged in the process, working on some roads. Those are services your forester can provide as well. So if you're thinking about selling timber, uh, you can actually start doing some work ahead of time. Uh, it's always a good idea to check with your forester when you start thinking about this. And if you decide that's the direction you wanna go, uh, a couple things I would strongly encourage you to look at, and I think your forester will tell you to do the same, is first off, uh, in getting ready for a sale to look at your property boundaries. So if you know your property boundaries, you wanna make sure they're marked clearly. That's gonna help in the logging operation. It's gonna help the forester in the marking operation of what trees to take, to make sure that we don't have any issues with taking trees that don't belong to you or operating off of the property and causing damage on somebody else's property. Uh, now, there are some situations where perhaps you've got a property line and the actual location of that line is a little fuzzy. I encourage you to work with your neighbors to the best of your ability to see if you can come to an agreement on where that property line is and get it marked if you can't come to an agreement, uh, there's a couple of approaches. Uh, it may be really handy for you to go ahead and have a survey to get that settled. If you don't wanna go to that expense, uh, the best thing you can do is stand off of that line and not mark any trees that might actually end up on the neighbor's property. So if there's a buffer zone there of however many feet where there's some uncertainty of where the line is, simply don't mark trees in that location. It's also a good idea to mark your boundaries in a way that's going to be long lasting and easy to see. So that once you go to the trouble of doing that, you can come back and find them and refresh those marks if need be. Indiana now has what's called a purple paint law. It allows you to mark trees and posts with purple paint, and that has the same force of law as posting no trespassing or private property signs. Uh, you can also use T posts or any number of other things. Uh, as long as they're brightly colored and you can refine those, that's a really appropriate and good idea to do, not only for timber sales, but just to keep track of the boundaries of your property. The other thing we strongly encourage landowners to do as part of a full, full property management process before timber harvesting is to kill uh, grapevines and invasive plants, particularly if they're in high numbers on your property where you're gonna be doing the harvesting. Uh, the problem with both of these is they're very aggressive growing plants that can strongly compete with your trees, both the mature trees and with tree regeneration. And so in the case of grapevines, uh, it often creates a, a more dangerous situation if there's lots of grapevines in the trees in the process of harvesting. And also the grapevines will respond strongly to that release of sunlight into the forest floor and grow very quickly. And so they can completely overtop trees and really squash regeneration uh, distort it, cover it over and out, compete it. 
And that same thing happens with the invasive plants, particularly heavy invasive shrub layers uh, where we've got a solid canopy understory, very much like here. All the green you see in this photo is Asian bush honeysuckle underneath the canopy of the forest. Uh, you can imagine what happens if we harvest in this area, releasing all that sunlight to the forest floor. These plants flourish, completely occupy that understory area and prevent regeneration of new native trees. Uh, so eliminating that invasive species growth two or three years before your timber harvest uh, is really strongly recommended. If you wait to do it after, you can do it, but you're fighting the quicker growth because they've got more sunlight and also the fact there's going to be a lot more slash and tops there, so it's a much more difficult operation to do. So doing those beforehand really gives you some benefits. The other thing that some folks don't consider, and it's certainly not required, but it's oftentimes a good recommendation, is to, uh, if you're planning on having a timber sale, notify your landowner, uh, neighboring landowners. Uh, you're not asking for permission to do this. You don't need that permission to, to harvest timber on your property. But if they don't know that that operation is going to take place, you're not sure what their reaction is going to be once things start. And so we have seen some scenes get started where uh, the equipment shows up and they get ready to start cutting and the neighbors show up and say, hey, what are you doing out here? And everything kind of grinds to a halt. So good communication with your neighbors. Let them know what's going to happen. Give them some expectation of what's coming up. Uh, can oftentimes short circuit those kind of problems and make sure that everybody understands what's going on. You may also have a situation in some properties where you may need to uh, see about getting access to parts of your property on a neighbor. And that's certainly something you would want to negotiate beforehand and make sure it's possible and understand what the conditions of that might be. Uh, there may be a section of your property where access is difficult through your property. If your neighbor is amenable to that and you can come to an agreement that may make the whole operation easier and, and simpler for the logger as well. So now that we've kind of prepared the ground for the timber sale, we want to talk about how timber can and oftentimes is sold from private lands here in Indiana. Uh, so I'm going to go through several sale types uh, and then talk about the type of sales that we typically recommend landowners use um, to alleviate some of the risks and get yourself into the marketplace and oftentimes get better results. And so the first one, and this is the one we oftentimes are recommending to landowners and is oftentimes provided by consulting foresters is the lump sum bid sale. So this is a situation where trees are marked for sale uh, by the forester. Uh, the trees are advertised to local and regional buyers and we set up a sealed bid opening on a certain date, time and place. And so we've got a competitive process We've got a known set of trees that are marked and advertising out into the marketplace to see if we can get a, a series of good competitive bids on that sale. And we call it lump sum because the uh, buyers are bidding on all the trees that are marked. They don't necessarily have to take all those trees, but it's understood that that is the set of trees that's for sale. Another type of sale that oftentimes is pretty common in a uh, negotiation between perhaps a landowner and a logger or timber buyer is what's called the share sale. And this is where the, uh, the timber buyer and the owner get an agreed upon percentage of the value of the cut trees, perhaps as they're paid by the mill. And so these oftentimes are like a 60, 40, 50, 50 or 40, 60 split. Uh, that the buyer and the owner split based on that agreement of whatever the mill is paying for the logs that are delivered as they're cut. And of course, one of the situations you're looking at is, well, is that is that fair? Uh, it's, it's hard to say. It depends on the value of the trees themselves and how difficult the logging is. They certainly have costs associated with logging, but there's also oftentimes significant value in some of the trees. The other thing is, uh, am I getting all of the uh, mill receipts reported to me? And so you need to have some level of trust and confidence that all of those things are being reported back to you. We can also see what's called a pay as cut situation. So the buyer pays based on an agreed upon amount for each unit of wood harvested. For So for every board foot or number of logs or whatever it is, there's a certain amount paid to the landowner for that volume and it might vary based on the species and value as well. Uh, once again, that's an issue of tracking 
and am I getting a, a decent amount for the timber? Well, if you don't have a competitive process, it may be hard to tell. Something that's less common, but still can happen, is you can simply contract with a logger to actually just do the logging services. So they're cutting, skidding out of the woods, loading up and hauling to the mill logs, and you're paying them for their services, and then you're getting whatever receipts you get from selling the logs at the mill. Uh, obviously, this would be complicated for most landowners. It's not very commonly done, although oftentimes if there's an exchange between folks in the industry, uh, this is not uncommon at all. So in many cases, we're typically recommending landowners look at the lump sum bid sale or the competitive situation it sets up and the fact that it simplifies the operation uh, and takes some of the risk factors out of it. So the other thing we wanna look at is how are trees selected for sale? And there are several different approaches there too. The one that we typically recommend for landowners is individually marked trees. And so the trees are marked with paint by the forester that's working with you to select those trees for sale. And those trees are selected based on their condition, current marketplaces and your objectives for the property. Uh, and so that's an individual tree by tree decision that's made between you and the forester based on your discussions of what you want to accomplish on the marketplace and what the forester understands about the biology of the forest the marketplace and the logistics of logging in that area. Uh, so there's a strong decision making process going on there. You'll notice that the tree is marked on the log and then also at the base. And that base essentially is your receipt showing that that tree was marked for sale after it's cut down. Now, could somebody take a, a can of paint out there and start marking additional stumps that they had cut? Sure, but Typically in that individual tree marking, we've got a tally tree by tree of the volume, the species and grade uh, that we could go back through and do a sale audit and say, hey, we've got more stumps than we had trees marked. We have a problem here. Uh, this is the technique that we typically recommend you go with uh, and most foresters will do this, this method. Uh, the other approach is a uh, what's called diameter limit or a diameter range. And so perhaps you've been offered to sell all the trees that are above 16 inches in diameter on your property. Uh, this is something that typically we don't recommend. Uh, it represents selling marketable trees, but it, if you're gonna be a longer term landowner, it may not represent the best approach to get the maximum value out of your property and may also in some cases short circuit other objectives you might have for your property in terms of wildlife habitat, aesthetics or recreation. And so oftentimes we're making decisions on what trees to market based on tree condition, uh, what trees they're competing with, current market conditions, uh, whether we can get that tree out without doing excessive damage, uh, where a diameter limit tends to be a little more across the board and oftentimes results in more trees harvested as well. Another option is if you're gonna have an area cleared, you can simply do a boundary or area a harvest, and this is typically where you are, in fact, changing the use of the property to something other than forest. So not nearly as common. Uh, in some cases, you might do that if uh, you're having an opening created, but almost always we would be tallying the individual trees to know about the volume, uh, the species and number of trees to be taken out in that opening. So uh, the recommended approach typically is individually marked trees. A wide, wide, wide variety of ways to mark trees. We want to always have a mark on the log and below the stump, but we can also uh, use a variety of different techniques. So spots, bands, uh, and then some foresters will number every tree. So if there's any discussion about quality or volume, we can go to a specific tree on the tally sheet. Uh, other foresters will oftentimes just number really high quality trees that are maybe going to go into high value veneer markets. Uh, it varies from forester to forester, but just to let you know, there's a variety of different ways we approach it. Uh, you just want to make sure you've got a mark on the log and then also a mark below the, the stump height. So we mentioned that we oftentimes are recommending you utilize the sealed bid process. I wanted to kind of walk through that. These are the basics. There's a lot more detail in here and a lot of things to consider, and that's where your forester really works with you to make sure this process goes the way you want it to. So you start with actually working with your forester to discuss this sale. Uh, what do I hope to accomplish? 
what are your recommendations to me as the forester? What are my concerns as a landowner? What do I want this property to look like down the road? Based on that conversation, the forester will go out and mark the trees that should be sold. Uh, they'll get measurements on those trees to get the volume and then also grade those trees to determine the quality and the species. And he simply sets up a tally of that uh, running total of the different species and grades of trees on the property and the number of trees for sale. With that tally, uh, the forester will set with you a date, time and place where solicited bids will be opened. Uh, the forester then sends out invitations to local and regional buyers and can even advertise in some circulars and websites for additional uh, exposure uh, to invite buyers to visit the sale area, to view the timber, and to submit bids. Uh, so the buyers then have the opportunity to take a look at the trees, they're marked for sale, and then submit a bid before the bid opening. And that bid submission might happen by mail, could happen by phone in, email, there's a variety of different techniques depending on the forester that are utilized to accept the bids. All bids have to be received before the bid opening. Once we get to the sale date, the time of opening, all the bids that have been received are opened and made public. At that point, you as the owner can work with your forester to decide whether you're going to accept uh, a winning bid, whether that winner will be the top bidder or some other bidder based on your knowledge of the bidders and the recommendation of your forester. And once that's done, then we start the payment and the contract process to go through the logging and harvesting of the trees. So as I said, kind of a broad overview, lots of details inside of this, but it gives you an idea of that process. And this is where the comp competitive act, uh, aspect of that process is important. Uh, and as a person who used to mark some timbers at District Forest years and years ago, I saw this play out in several cases in that a uh, standing tree in the woods is not really a commodity, it's more of a spot market. And depending on who the buyer is and what markets they've got and how uh, hungry they are for that particular type of tree and grade, uh, that depends on what they're able to bid. Uh, and we see a lot of variation in bids across the landscape for different types and qualities of trees. And it can vary an awful lot as the quality of the trees gets higher. Uh, so really high value, high quality trees uh, can go into some really high value markets and some folks have done simply a better job at developing those or are willing to wait those markets out and buy good trees when they have the chance. So we can see quite a bit of divergence in the amount of money offered between one bidder and the next. Uh, this particular sale, we've changed the names, but the uh, dollar figures are actually accurate. It's been from many years ago. This was an exceptional sale in the terms of the number of bidders. Normally we're looking at perhaps uh, three to six bidders would not be too uncommon on a standard sale of normal timber in Indiana. Uh, this one got 19, that's pretty exceptional. Uh, but you can see the range in bids. And so this comes from that competitive process and also advertising to make sure that your sale is in front of the uh, scope of bidders that may be interested in it. So another way that an awful lot of timber is sold is folks being approached at their door by a timber buyer interested in buying timber. And when that offer is made at the door, the question is, well, how do you know where that offer stands in terms of the marketplace? So unless you're in the marketplace, you really don't have any way of knowing. And so if you decide to accept that at the bid, at the door bid, you're hoping it's like buyer number one or number two. But if they don't think they're in competition with anybody else, they're probably not going to offer you that price that you see there either. And so this comes from good advertising and a competitive process. And it's not unusual to see a 100% spread between the bottom bid and top bid. Uh, and a lot of that goes to what the buyers are looking to get, what kind of markets they've developed, and how hungry they are for that wood. Uh, and I'm actually going to give you a personal example here. So I just this last year put timber up for sale on my property and sold uh, 43,400 board feet of mostly low grade. This is going to go mostly to pallet material, low grade wood. Wasn't expecting a lot of money out of it. Didn't figure I'd get a whole lot of bids. Uh, come the day of the bid opening, we had three bids, uh, 8,400, 9,500. That's kind of the range I expected. I thought it would land somewhere between $8,000 and $10,000 for the sale. 
open the last bid, it's $13,500. And so that competitive process, that sealed bid sale, provided me a 30% premium over what I expected uh, and over the next highest bid. And exactly what type of marketplace this person has generated, I'm, I'm going to be interested in talking to them and seeing uh, that they could bid that much more. But chances are I would have never seen that had I not had that competitive process. So we're talking about risk reduction. Number one, you know, Forester Services, use that contract to protect your interests, competitive process, um, effective marketing. Uh, the trees to sell are all marked and there's a reason each of them is marked based on um, their biology, the marketplace and your objectives for the property. Another really important part, and this comes under the contract, is making sure you're paid before any timber is harvested. So oftentimes when we have a bid sale and a contract, uh, there's a certain amount of money due, maybe 20 or 30 percent, within 30 days of uh, the sale uh, and contract signing. Uh, that is, is pretty common. And then the other stipulation is that all payment is due before any timber is harvested. And so if they're interested in starting to the timber harvest really shortly after the contract signing, well, all the money needs to be paid up front before that saw ever starts into a tree. And the reason you want that is that occasionally uh, a company may go out of business or go bankrupt or have some other issue. And if you've already got logs headed to the mill and don't have payment, you may not get payment for those trees. So making sure that your risks are covered by payment up front is an important aspect of that. The uh, contract will also stipulate the conditions and timing for logging. And so if you've got issues about crop entry times, uh, obviously we want to not have logging when the soil conditions are wet enough, it's going to do damage to the site. All those things are going to be lined out uh, and your forester will work with you to make sure that those are all understood and set expectations between the logger and yourself for that operation. So that's another important service that your forester provides is monitoring and establishing expectations of the operation and making sure everybody understands where the other person is and that the contract is being abided by. Another safeguard we have in Indiana for uh, risk reduction is the timber buyer's licensing law. And so anybody that buys standing timber from private property in Indiana is required to have a license and be bonded with the state of Indiana. Uh, and so that does provide some control over bad actors. And also, uh, also oftentimes spelled out in the contract is uh, the requirement to have uh, liability insurance and also workers comp uh, or workman's comp for those folks that are going to be operating on your property doing the logging. So as I mentioned, one of the most important things your forester can help you with is uh, setting expectations and good communication back and forth between yourself and the logger and the forester. Uh, a, a forester friend of mine describes this as a three-legged stool that keeps the whole operation stable. You pull one leg out and things aren't stable anymore. And so making sure there's good communication, a, a understanding of the expectations and the contract requirements, uh, an opportunity to ask and answer questions, that's going to help this whole situation move along easier uh, and be a pleasant situation for everybody. So one of the issues that folks are oftentimes concerned with, and, and rightly so, is uh, am I going to have excessive erosion as a result of this harvest? And in Indiana, we have a voluntary set of practices called best management practices. And they're actually lined out. Uh, the DNR Division of Forestry, working with several other partners, uh, helped develop these many years ago. Uh, and still utilize these uh, extensively on both public and private uh, timber sales. And they are designed to help minimize the erosion and movement of sediments off the site and into streams uh, and deg degradation of soil quality and forest health. Uh, and so there's a variety of practices we utilize to get uh, water off of trails, uh, to minimize stream, stream crossings, to minimize any kind of oil spills or things like that, and outline what the expectations are for operations. And even though these practices are voluntary, you can make them a part of your timber sale contract. And so those expectations are set. Uh, and one of the important aspects is that most erosion that happens in a timber sale operation is happening on the skid trails and the haul roads. 
And so the practices we put in place, <coughs> pardon me, like water bars or broad based dips like what we see here are designed to get water off of those roads and trails onto the forest floor where it can soak in and not have erosion happening and not having sediment entering streams. So there are certainly ways to deal with those erosion concerns. So how does this operation work once we get ready to start harvesting? Well, historically, it's been primarily uh, uh, folks operating large uh, uh, commercial chainsaws felling the trees and then uh, a variety of different types of skidders pulling the trees out of the woods to a landing. Well, they'll, they'll be bucked up into log lengths and then loaded on a truck to, to head to the mill. And that's still how an awful lot of it's done in our woodlands. But we are seeing a, a new piece of equipment entering the woodlands now, and that's the, uh, the feller buncher. And some of this is related to the inherent danger associated uh, with having folks on the ground with chainsaws felling trees. It, it's a very dangerous occupation. Uh, and it's difficult to sometimes find people able to do that work and also can be difficult to maintain insurance on a situation like that. Uh, so for that reason, and also for some production reasons, there's more and more outfits that are utilizing these feller bunchers. And they're really uh, incredible pieces of equipment that actually do a, a really nice job in the forest. And since they are tracked, oftentimes don't have uh, really significant uh, soil damage or erosion issues associated with them. So as we mentioned, logging is a, a dangerous and very difficult area of work. It requires a, a lot of specialized and expensive equipment, and it takes significant skill and effort to do a good job. Uh, and the good news here in Indiana is that we have uh, uh, loggers who are well-trained, have the logger training programs available to them, and also uh, a gradually improving quality and type of equipment available to them and so we're seeing enhanced safety and efficiency in logging operations through time. And in addition, as you work with your forester and have a good contract, that also helps provide that setup of expectations for the quality of work you want to see done on your property. And so it can be an excellent partnership to help you get those trees harvested in, in a safe, effective, and environmentally friendly way. And I wanted to show you just a little graph here of the supply chain and how this material moves. And so you as private landowners are the owners of standing timber in Indiana primarily. It's 85% it's private ownership of our forests. So most of the wood going into the wood using industry is coming from private lands. As we mentioned, that can come in through an industrial forester, through a consulting forester, or through a timber broker or buyer uh, that is helping you sell your, your wood. But what I want you to notice is that everything is channeling through the logger. And so these are the the folks that are actually making it possible for that material to get to the mill and providing value to you for that product. Uh, and so uh, sometimes loggers aren't looked at very kindly, uh, have a, uh, been given a bad reputation at times. Some of them uh, have done things that, that maybe deserve that, but most of the ones I know are hardworking folks uh, trying to make a living like everybody else and actually are very interested in doing the very best work they can. Uh, we need to recognize how important they are in this process. And as we communicate and set expectations, all of this can work really well. Uh, and they are a critical part of this whole chain of events that leads to ultimately our capacity to harvest timber for value here in the state. Lots of different products that our, our trees can be turned into based on their species and quality. Uh, on the lower part of the page here, we've got sheets of white oak veneer from our highest quality trees. Uh, still have veneer mills here in Indiana that are slicing high quality logs into very valuable veneer that stays here in the United States, but also is shipped all over the world. Uh, in the upper uh, right hand corner, we've got uh, some ash logs that may be sawed into dimensional lumber or could be utilized for construction grade lumber or could be loaded on a container and shipped overseas as logs uh, to be utilized uh, for products over there or shipped as lumber overseas. Both of those happen. Uh, also, to a lesser extent, we see some fuel wood processing and we don't have any pulp mills here in the state, but we do have uh, one in Kentucky. And so the southern third or quarter of the state will sometimes feed into those mills as well. So lots of different product potential here, uh, depending on the quality, grade, and species of trees we're looking at. 
And so as you think about this process of harvesting trees, we mentioned how important tree selection is. I want to talk about that just briefly. One of the things I encourage landowners to do is think about working continually for improvement of your property uh, when you utilize harvesting. And so what that means is that we are going to take where we have the opportunity to low quality, low value, damaged or diseased trees, get those into the marketplace, uh, take them out of the woods before they die to provide additional growing space for trees that are going to do a better job of meeting your management objectives. And your forester will obviously be able to help you with that decision making process. These trees don't oftentimes have huge value, but they typically have enough value that they can get into the marketplace. And the big advantage for harvesting them is you've made additional growing space for something that may be much more valuable for wildlife, for timber production, for recreation, for aesthetics, whatever your management objectives are. So taking some low grade, low quality trees, something we should always be thinking about doing in the process of harvesting. We're also gonna look at harvesting some mature trees. Uh, in this case, this is actually my property, is some big old mature sycamore and hackberry. Neither of these trees are highly valuable. They're oftentimes used for pallet and construction grade material, but they're big, they're mature, uh, probably going to go downhill rather than increasing grade and value through time. And so it's time to move them on, provide additional growing space for some other younger trees to come on. One of the things that may be a temptation and is sometimes offered to you in the process of door-to-door -to -door, uh, solicitation to sell timber is a practice we call high grading. And this is where you're offered to sell uh, just a few of the very highest quality trees on your property. And so you may get what looks like a pretty good big paycheck for selling very few trees. There's a couple of problems with that though. Uh, if you're only selling your high quality trees, what you're leaving behind to grow on your property and reproduce are the lower grade, lower value, lower quality trees. And so in that process of only selling your best trees, you're gradually degrading the overall quality of the trees in your property over time. You also need to recognize that those high quality trees, if they're allowed to grow bigger, oftentimes are making much more in terms of value growth per year than the low quality trees. And so if I needed cash and I had a CD that was making 2% and a CD that was making 5%, uh, I'd like to keep the CD making 5% growing and I'd cash out the one with two. Well, taking your very highest quality trees, perhaps when they're younger trees, kind of short circuits that process. And so this is a really high quality black walnut tree. It's about 17 inches in diameter, so it'd be big enough to harvest, but it's got a long life ahead of it and a huge potential to gain much more volume and value and perhaps grow it to a 22 to 24 inch tree or better based on the site. And we've added a lot of volume. We've added an enormous number amount of value in many cases. Uh, and so rather than harvesting that tree young like this, let it have an opportunity to grow, take some lower quality trees, uh, deferred gratification not, uh, oftentimes is a really good idea over the long term. And so what I encourage you to do is resist that temptation to high grade, uh, taking only the best and leaving the rest. Look at continuous improvement and growing your highest quality trees for as long as you can to produce that high value. We also have some tax considerations associated with selling trees. Uh, and so when we sell trees, uh, there's a variety of different situations we can get in in terms of, of taxation issues. And this is not tax advice. It's a complicated area, but some guidance to help you think about these issues and something your forester can certainly give you some assistance with. So when we sell trees, they may possibly be taxed at a capital gain rate if we meet certain conditions. So in most cases, when you're doing a lump sum sealed bid sale of standing timber, uh, that is typically eligible for capital gains treatment and the capital gains rate on taxes, which is normally lower than regular uh, income tax, personal income tax rates. If we are selling logs, oftentimes you're not eligible for capital gains because you're selling a manufactured product. Uh, so the standing trees, are looked at as a capital asset that has grown through time and you get that capital gains rate. If you essentially do a manufacturing process, cut the trees down and sell them as logs, you may not be eligible for that capital gain treatment. So it's important 
to talk with your forester about those tax issues in terms of what context you're going to sell those trees into. To get long-term capital gain rates, you need to have owned those trees for over a year. And so if you're a recent acquirer of property, that may be a consideration to think of too, is waiting a year before you have your timber sale so you get the advantage of that long-term capital gain. We can also look at the costs associated with the sale of timber and add those to what's called your basis or your cost to acquire the timber to offset some of the income uh, tax liability you may have. And so costs associated with that sale might be the forester's fees. If you had to have some survey work done to establish boundaries, uh, anything like that to get ready to actually do the sale uh, and, and costs directly associated with the sale of the timber. We can take those costs and add them into the cost you have to acquire the timber, whether it be a purchase or the value of the trees if you inherited them uh, in a property that was passed to you uh, as an inheritance. And so that capital basis, your cost of acquisition of the timber, can offset some of your tax liability, essentially is acting as a cost against income. But what is that basis? So typically when we purchase a property, you're buying property based on a some flat amount or some amount per acre, and it includes both the land and the timber. To determine the basis of the timber that we can use as a cost against income, you're going to need a forester to help you do that through taking inventory of your forest area, determining its value uh, in terms of the fair market value of the trees at the time you acquired the property, and setting up your basis and then adding any costs or uh, extra capital uh, uh, investments you put into that timber through time. So this is something a forester can assist you with. And it's a really valuable tool to help you re uh, reduce your income tax liability when you sell timber. Uh, I have done this for my property, and even though I had sold uh, my timber 10 years after acquisition of the property, I still got a nice reduction in the amount that I actually am going to have to pay income tax on because I was able to use that cost against the income I'm getting for the sale of timber. If you want to look deeper into this issue, this website uh, www.timbertax.org provides a lot of great information uh, on the tax treatment of timber income and your forester can give you a lot of direction in this area. Uh, but it's a very important area to look at in terms of saving uh, uh, money uh, in terms of tax liability and it's one that a lot of people don't take advantage of. And the real advantage of this comes from using it uh, shortly after you acquire property. And so if you've purchased property that has timberland on it, you get your basis, uh, you have a timber sale maybe two years after the acquisition, an awful lot of the income off of that sale can be offset by the fact that you've got essentially a cost of the cost of acquisition of that timber that can be applied against that income. As more time passes and the timber grows in volume and size and value, uh, your actual basis that you can apply against income decreases because your ownership period, the growth of the timber in terms of volume and value over that time is actually a capital gain. Uh, it's the gain that happened during the time of your tenure. And so you can't, you can't treat that as a basis. Your basis is your cost of acquisition. But as I mentioned, it can still be significant even after 10 or 15 years and in some cases more. A really neat trick, if you're thinking about how could I pass uh, some significant value to heirs, if you own good quality timberland, high quality trees uh, that perhaps are ready to market or could be marketed in the future, if you pass those to heirs as an inheritance, the heirs are able to do what we call a step up in basis. And so their basis is the fair market value of those trees at the time of transfer. So you may have owned that timberland for 40 years and had all of this capital gain increase in value on the timber over that period of time. Uh, and your basis may have been quite small on that property at that point in time because of all the time that's passed. But once you pass it to heirs as an inheritance, they get a step up in that basis value to the fair market value at the time of, of that transfer. So if they have a timber sale maybe a year or two after they've acquired it, they're going to have very little income tax liability uh, using that basis against income that they get from the sale. So it's a great way to pass an asset 
with minimal tax liability on to heirs in the future. Uh, something else I think a lot of people don't realize and haven't thought about, but a great tool you can utilize. Uh, the other thing you can access is actual assistance from the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, for management on your property. And so some of the things we have recommended to do, look at uh, controlling grapevines, controlling invasive species, uh, perhaps doing some wildlife management habitat work, planting trees possibly after your timber sale to fill in some openings with desirable species. All those things may be things you can actually get cost sharing or cost assistance from through the U.S. Department of Agriculture Natural Resource Conservation Service. And they have a variety of conservation activities and programs that you can tap into that may actually help offset some of your costs of doing these management practices. So you want to contact your local USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service office to see what those programs are that may fit into your property and how you can tap into those. If you've got uh, just a small amount of timber uh, that uh, maybe you've got to take a few trees down to put up a garage, they've been blown over in a storm, it's not going to be enough to have a, a full scale commercial timber harvest. If you want to utilize that material, the uh, Woodmiser Sawmill Company, actually a manufacturer right here in Indiana, has a referral service that they can refer you to local custom sawyers who own their mills, have purchased them from the company, and uh, are willing to hire out their services to saw wood on site. And so this is a neat way to utilize small volumes of material for your own personal use uh, by jobbers that will come out and do that sawing custom for you. Uh, really a, a nice service that's available for landowners. So the Woodmiser Sawmill Company, you can simply uh, Google Woodmiser. Uh, don't even have to remember this whole long uh, uh, website here. Uh, and they've got a referral service on site there on their website. If you're interested in looking at relative timber values, there's a variety of ways you can go about doing that. Now, I will uh, emphasize now and then emphasize after I emphasize it now that what you've got to remember, though, is every time you look at those prices, they're already out of date. And so these prices are typically posted for survey work that's been done a few months earlier. And timber markets are very volatile, uh, very dynamic. And so whenever you're looking at prices, it's always a relative valuation it's not absolute pricing at the time you're not getting that kind of up-to-date information and so the indiana forest products price report is put out uh, twice a year by the indiana dnr division of forestry and posted on their site uh, so you can access that there uh, in addition purdue used to put this up and still maintains historic price reports clear back some of the earliest ones are in the 1930s and so if you're interested or need to utilize uh, historic timber price reports for perhaps setting up a basis from a purchase of a property 10 years ago, you can get access to those. Uh, you can get lumber pricing reports uh, on a subscription basis from a variety of different uh, hardwood uh, market reporting firms. However, it is a paid subscription to get those. And those provide typically weekly reports and are pricing lumber essentially to the penny. But you've got to remember when you're selling standing trees in the woods, there's a lot of manufacturing processes and expenses that goes into making that lumber. And so it can be difficult to translate that back to the actual value of standing trees, but it gives some feel for relative species valuations. And then also annually in the uh, Indiana Woodland Steward newsletter, uh, there's a stumpage price report on private land sales provided by uh, the consulting foresters. And so they pool the prices that they've gotten for timber uh, and categorize it into low, mid, and high value timber sales and provide this general summary of what the timber market looks like for what we call stumpage sales. That's where we're, uh, timber buyers are buying standing timber from private landowners. But once again, remember all of this information is dated and therefore is really only valuable for comparisons, but not for actual valuation at the time. So several different resources and references you can tap into. Uh, a lot of this information is available from the Call Before You Cut site here. And so this is a, a multi-state effort to provide timber uh, sales information and considerations for landowners. And so lots of good references there. Uh, and once again, you can locate a professional forester through this Find Indiana Forester site. Uh, the timber tax issues through Indiana's, um, or pardon me, the, the National Timber Tax website, timbertax.org. 
Indiana maintains the licensed timber buyers program and also maintains a list of licensed timber buyers that you can access through this website. And then the cost sharing programs we mentioned through the Indiana Natural Resources Conservation Service programs. Uh, once again, you can Google those uh, those titles and it'll take you right to uh, the locations you want to go. Lots of good information if you want to get more background on what we've talked about this evening. So I should uh, at this time go back out. And so I'm going to stop sharing. And we'll have a chance to cover any questions that may have come through. I'm going to pass the ball back over to John here. Thank you, Lenny. A lot of great information there. And, uh, you know, perhaps you're somebody who uh, are considering um, a timber sale. Uh, maybe you're one who may have some timberland coming to you in the future. Um, I thought, uh, I've always thought it was particularly helpful about that. You know, if you inherit land to do that step up and basis so that you have a, uh, a value at time of acquisition that you can um, then reduce your tax liability later on. I thought that was that was really good. If any of you have any questions, there is a little chat window toward the bottom of your screen. If you want to hover over that and click on it, it should bring up the chat pod and you can uh, type in a question to all participants and we'll just handle those as we come. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to um share one of well see if i can get this done i don't know um share the evaluation for this um oh shoot that's not what i want <laughs> bear with me here just a moment okay Okay, I'm not sure what I did there, but uh, anyway, any questions from anyone? Uh, we can type it into the chat. Gosh, Lenny, I guess I'm not seeing anyone or any. Um, Either I did a really good job or a really bad one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness, and I'm not having any luck sharing my screen, I'm afraid, for some reason. So, John, I've got uh, one of our attendees raised his hand. Okay. And it's, and it's gone now. I've lost it. So maybe maybe right. that maybe that was a mistake. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, let me I can share here. I'm not sure if this will actually share or not. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, it's up. Okay. So the ones who are, are still on the call, if you want to fire up your smartphone app and just use that QR code, that will take you to the evaluation. If uh, you would rather just do it uh, via the website, that's fine. Instead of that big long thing, uh, both of those websites will take, or all three uh, methods will take you to the same evaluation. But that uh, small one at the bottom, uh, HTTPS uh, colon slash slash BIT dot LY and then slash WM512 stands for Woodland Management May 12th. Um, we'd appreciate your feedback on, on our program for tonight. Um, I would li also like to thank Lenny uh, sincerely for a, a great job tonight and uh, let you all know that we are recording this program. And uh, so if you need to review it, uh, hopefully the recording will be successful. I know have no way of knowing that until the next day, uh, but come back to the Purdue Extension Whitley County website and there should be an article right on the front page of Woodland Management webinars and uh, the link to that recording should be available here in the next couple of days. And I might even be able to put some of the slides up that Lenny shared. That was a lot of good information. So uh, again, uh, thank you for your participation. I'm going to exit out of this and get back to 
Uh, oops. Stop sharing. Uh, any questions here? Let's see, Lenny, let's see. Logger training programs were mentioned. Where can I find them? Uh, those are offered through the Indiana DNR Division of Forestry and also through the Indiana Hardwood Lumberman's Association. And that's the uh, trade association for the wood products industry here in Indiana. Both of those folks uh, will offer occasional logger training. Okay. Another question. Uh, somebody wanted to offer you thanks. They bought 30 acres of woods and moving there in two weeks with uh, three 22 inch or bigger oak and poplar. This is helpful. Oh, just a comment of thanks there. Uh, great, great. Uh, also, lots of great info. No current questions, but had state forest land around my home log this winter. It was quite the experience as we share the state forest road to our home. Okay. And uh, another one. Um, what is the typical time period between timber harvests of the same property? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, it, it Some of it does depend on the intensity uh, of the harvest, how many trees are taken per acre and what you want to accomplish, but it's not unusual to have a harvest uh, every 10 to 15 years uh, on a property. I've seen that happen um, in several situations. It can vary some also depending on the productivity of the site. So if you got really highly productive site, lots of trees per acre, that 10 year timeline can work. If maybe not as productive, not as many trees per acre, or you want to have lower intensity every 15 years is not unusual. And Lenny, a question came up at a previous program we had um, out at NEPAC recently. Um, is it, it it's not unusual to come in like you did and, and maybe harvest some of the lower quality trees first in a woods uh, to give growth and, uh, you know, for a future higher value harvest. Is that true? Yeah, that's, that's something actually we'll oftentimes recommend is what we do, call an improvement harvest to uh, take out lower grade, lower quality, over mature damaged trees. Uh, and in many cases, we're also maybe harvesting a few higher quality mature trees at that same time that we're concerned may not make it that 10 or 15 years to the next harvest. But if you look at the returns on different trees in terms of growth in wood volume and value, uh, you really want to let those high quality trees get to be bigger size and really kind of uh, max out their productive life before you harvest them because their value increases so much bigger than low quality, low value trees. Yeah, and of course, all this relates back to your, your personal goals for your property and what kind of management you need to uh, uh, take you know, to, to an act to, uh, to get to those goals. So uh, we've talked a lot about timber harvest and timber valuation tonight, but there are a lot of other goals that may be uh, foremost on your mind over timber harvest too, so. All right, well, I think that takes care of our questions. So Lenny, I want to thank you again for your program tonight and thank all the participants. Again, if you could please uh, fill out the evaluation, it shouldn't take you but three or four minutes. We'd really appreciate that. And uh, thank you for your participation tonight. Thank you, John, it was a pleasure.